Live from Earth, it's Space Radio. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Stony Brook University and the Flatiron Institute. And for the next half hour, your agent to the stars, we've got an amazing show for you today where we are talking about SpaceX versus astronomy. Fight! Round one begin. And taking listener questions about all things in the universe, even relate. You guys need relationship advice. I'll give you relationship advice. Let's do it. Let's do some serious astro therapy tonight. We record every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern here at Spaceman Studios in New York City. Leave a voicemail to get yourself on the air. You can also follow along with our space cadets tuning in live from around the world, including but not limited to Chicago, Illinois, Indiana, London, UK, Columbus, Ohio, Washington, D.C., Germany, and Pell City, Alabama, and more. Thank you, everyone, all space cadets, for showing up today for this very, very exciting edition. Man, last week was a blast, wasn't it? Talking with Professor Jason Wright at Penn State University, talking about SETI. I certainly, I learned a few things. You know, I try to... I try to learn something new every day. Sometimes, usually it's about something mundane, but but last week, last Thursday, was about something mind-blowing. If you haven't caught that episode already, I suggest you listen to it. Um, yeah, Dr. Jason Wright and I have disagreed about things in the past where uh, even like journalists have like quoted him and quoted me, and it looks like we're having a big fight. We disagree, you know... Lots of scientists disagree. We can also like, you know, have dinner together respectfully and, and and have a good conversation about stuff that we're both interested in and stuff we do agree on. And we do agree on a lot. I almost, almost went into an Avi Loeb Oumuamua rant again, but I, I'm going to say that. So what I did. A journal, Inference, uh, it's an amazing journal, not just because they invited me to write a review of, of Alvi Loeb's book, but they're they're already awesome, and they invited me to do a review, so I got the book, I read the whole thing. This is Avi Loeb, Harvard astronomer, book on how Oumuamua is a piece of alien technology. I wrote the review. One of these episodes, when the review is published, or about to be published, uh, I'm gonna I'm just going to read it aloud in one of these episodes so that you can have my full take on it. Now, there's something else I need to rant about today. And by the way, go to spaceradioshow.com for all those links if you want to drop a voicemail, if you want to join the Space Cadets Thursdays, 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, there's cheese at the end, which is only for me. I mean, bring BYOC. Bring your own cheese to the episode, and, and we can all share it together. Now... What I wanted to talk about today to start us off is an issue that has been growing for at least a year. And this is an issue that at, f- at first I was like ambivalent and then like, you know, benefit of the doubt. And I'm st- as the days go by, I'm starting to lean more and more and more uh, towards one side. And I think you're going to pick up what I'm talking about. So I'm uh, there's a bunch of companies. Uh, SpaceX is doing it. There's a UK-based company called OneWeb. Uh, Blue Origins, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos' company, Blue Origins, is doing it. There's probably like five others. Like the Chinese government has said they're just going to do it. Uh, they're launching me- what are called mega constellations of satellites. So not like a few communication satellites. We're talking about tens of thousands of communication satellites that completely en- engulf the the globe of the earth and the point of this is each company is going to have tens of thousands like spacex already has 1300 up blue origins is launching like a few hundred this year spacex is doing a few with more thousand one web is doing a few thousand so like over the next five to ten years we're gonna have easily like a hundred thousand of these communication satellites plus all the other satellites that we're gonna have up there Now, there is a benefit to this, and I want to highlight the benefit. The benefit is you get global high-speed internet access from a variety of companies. So they're all competing against each other for your dollar. 
uh, and and you can be anywhere in the world. You could be at you know the southern tip of South America. You could be in Iceland. Uh, you could be in the middle of the Siberian you know taiga forest. You could be anywhere you want, and you get super fast high speed internet, which is is a benefit to humanity. Having having high easily accessible high speed internet is generally I'm going to go ahead and say, you can disagree with this if you want, but I'm going to go ahead and say it's a net benefit to humanity. But it does come at a cost. And the live streamers here are seeing an animation of one such cost, which is uh, SpaceX's communication satellites are called the Starlink satellites. And they are... Um, they're just in orbit all the time. And because their communication and their high speed, they have to be relatively close to the earth and they have to be very, very shiny because they need lots of solar panels and so they need lots of electricity. So they're very bright. So you can see them with the naked eye and you can see them with telescopes. And so here's the animation I'm showing to the space cadets right now is some Starlink satellites streaking over the night sky uh, above the uh, observatory in Hawaii. Okay, why is this a big deal? It's a big deal for a couple reasons. One, when a satellite passes over an observing target of a giant telescope, it spoils it. It ruins the data. You can't filter it out. It's just, it's just gone. It's just junk. It's like, it's like if a lightning bolt struck your, you know, struck your photographic plate when you're doing this. It's just, it's, it's bad. You have to redo it. You have to, it's just junk data now. You have to, you can't just filter it out. You have to get rid of the whole thing. And the more and more satellites that are up there, as we go from a few thousand to tens of thousands and over a hundred thousand, that means with the goal, think about it, the goal is to always have satellites overhead so you can always have high speed internet access. Which means if you have an observatory, like say the Vera Rubin Observatory, which is being built in Argentina, or sorry, Chile, in the Atacama Desert, and it's huge, it used to be called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. It's just gigantic, it's, it's, it has an observing area like 40 times the width of the moon. It's gigantic, and uh, it can it's supposed to scan the night sky every single night. The entire sky, every single night, just generates so much raw data. Every one of those night skies are gonna have Starlink, or OneWeb, or, or, or whatever, communication satellites in it. How are we supposed to do astronomy if every picture is photobombed by a communication satellite? Like every picture, because that's the goal of these communication pictures, of these satellites. And what's more, even if they're not directly in the sky, every single satellite is a little bit reflective or a lot reflective. And it contributes to a little bit of brightness overall in the sky. It just scatters a little bit of sunlight. So even if it's not in your in your frame for your telescope observations, it's not in down the barrel, it's still like reflecting a little bit of light. Already over the past five decades, we've increased the sky brightness, the average sky brightness across the entire globe by 10% due to our satellites. This is a recent study that just came out. 10% just by having so much junk up there. They're all contributing a little bit of brightness. So we've already brightened the night sky, even out in our, the deepest deserts, the middle of the ocean, so far away from land, light pollution, the sky overall is 10% brighter than it used to be. And then you start throwing up tens of thousands of these telescopes and multiplying in 100,000. How, how much brighter is the sky going to get? And how much is that going to ruin astronomy and make astronomy difficult? And I'm not just talking about this from the perspective of like, oh, I wish I want all my astronomy friends to keep a job. Like, this is fundamental science. This is trying to understand our place in the universe. Astronomy has been with us for millennia. 
And it's been important to humanity for millennia. And that importance has not gone away. In fact, it's, it's more important than ever. And there's one quote in this article I found uh, by Vox. And the quote is from Caitlin Casey, who's an astronomer at the University of Texas, Austin. And this quote really struck me. She said, uh, the fact that one person or one company can take control and completely transform humans' experience of the night sky, and not just humans, but every organism on Earth, that seems profoundly wrong. That does. The choice to put up these satellites and tens of thousands of satellites, and there's no law against it. Like, we could just tell SpaceX to stop if we felt like it, but then we can't stop, like, a, a, a company in China doing it or a company in Germany in the EU doing it because this is a global problem. There's, like, a global solution, which means there's no solution. And just one person can be like, you know what? I want 100,000 satellites up there in a decade. And I guess we don't have astronomy anymore. And I guess you don't get to see a clear dark sky no matter where you go. Too bad. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't sign up for that. I didn't vote for that. I didn't ask for that. I didn't get to debate it. Maybe, maybe the net benefit to humanity of having global access is worth a little bit more sky brightness. Maybe. But I feel like we're not getting to have that debate. Like the astronomers aren't getting enough voice. And, and who's going to stop SpaceX? Like uh, astronomers have approached SpaceX and talked about this. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll darken this out. Like we'll paint them black, essentially. Um, um, they started that kind of, but it's not really doing what it was promised. Uh, they're almost as bright as they were before. They're still visible to the naked eye. They're still spoiling observations and they're not going to, they said they're not going to stop the launches while they figure it out. They're just like, maybe we'll try to make it darker. Maybe not. So let's just, you know, okay, we, we, we hear you, but it's not our number one priority. So how do we have this debate? How do we have this conversation? How do we, how, how do we gather support and say, wait, wait, wait. This is important for astronomy. This is important for amateur hobbyist sky gazers. This is important for just enjoying a natural resource, a.k.a. the night sky, just like we would preserve like wetlands or mountains or a national park. We would want to preserve the night sky as a, as a resource and something that all of humanity can benefit from. And we just don't get to have that anymore or we get a worse experience. And just one person or a few people or a few company get to make that decision for us and we don't get input into that, that seems wrong. <sighs> That's where I am right now. And, and it took me a while because I'm like, yeah, it, it, okay, a few images might be messed up, but like global internet access is pretty, sounds pretty awesome to me. I'm leaning more and more towards um, these companies are not really paying attention and humanity is going to be worse off for it. And we're not getting to have the dialogue and the conversation and the debate that we need to find the best compromise. I did not, I did not. Yeah. Oh, zero skull is asking the UN. Yeah. So the international astronomical union has approached the UN and there's like a committee and a subcommittee that's going to meet in August and like, yes, but they have absolutely no teeth, absolutely no power. They can issue a recommendation and say, we, you need to make these satellites. This is the voice of the UN, by the way. You need to make these satellites darker by 90% and SpaceX will be like, no. But you really need, no, well, we already launched 20,000 and we don't want to work on this problem anymore. We're going to launch another 20,000. That's it. That's it. That's what we got. Who do you think CDP is asking? Uh, who do you think should regulate this, Paul? I don't know. I don't know. We could decide. We could, you know, we could petition Biden and Biden could say, hey, FCC, revoke S SpaceX's license to do this. They're not doing any more. Okay, we could stop that. But then who stops OneWeb? 
Who stops a Chinese company? Who stops SpaceX for creating a Chinese shell company and doing it from there anyway? I don't know. And it's, it's starting to bother me. It's starting to bother me. We get, let's, let's, let's take a break from the rants. I didn't realize, which I know I say this like every week that I didn't realize I would go into a rant and I end up turning into a rant. So maybe, maybe, maybe I should just call this space rant radio. I don't know. Yes, uh, C. Luke is pointing out some uh, in Fifth Dimension saying satellites and climate change, like a sim- very similar issue. Um, open ocean is, yeah. Like how do you deal with like international fishing rights in, in like a fair manner so that people get fish and we don't kill all the fish? Like, <sighs> should I have cheese? No, no. I'm going to wait till the end of the show to have cheese. I'm going to be I'm going to be a good spaceman. But I'm going to tell you uh, that if you want to join the conversation as such as it is, go to spaceradioshow.com and there's links where you can join the Space Cadets Live. You can leave a voicemail and also please go to patreon.com slash PM Sutter to keep these rants going. These these rants cost energy, man. And energy is money. Patreon.com slash PM Sutter. P is in Paul, M is in Matthew Sutter. It's like Sutter, but... um, with an S. So it's exactly like itself. It's Sutter. And uh, you can support the show. And if you're on YouTube, you can go to Super Chat. You can leave a Super Chat anytime and leave a one-time donation right there. Let's listen to a voicemail. Let's let's calm me down for a bit. Who should we listen to? Who should we? Here we go. Here we go. Hi, Steve Lucy here. Now, the universe is big. So big that even at the speed of light, not all the light out there has had time to get to here. So when I heard on the news that astronomers were surprised to find galaxies out near the edge of the observable universe, I thought, why be surprised? Surely out there is even more galaxies and so on. So yeah, why? Steve, Lucy, one, I really appreciate uh, the tone of your voice and the slight incredulity, incredulity, that's not a word, incredulousness uh, with which you approached the topic. I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. You're right. The universe is very large. It is far larger than our observable bubble. We can see only a limited part of the universe because the speed of light is only so fast and the universe has only been around for so long. So we get a little chunk of it and then past that chunk, there's more galaxies. What this surprise is, is that the farther back we look in space, the farther back we look in time. So the images of galaxies, of very distant galaxies, are images not as the galaxies are today, right now, they are as of galaxies in the past. So, for example, the the Andromeda galaxy is 5 million light years away. That picture, the, the, the photons that are hitting your eyeball or your telescope were generated 5 million years ago. So it's the Andromeda galaxy as it was 5 million years ago. So the farther back we look in space, the further back we look in time. And we're looking into a younger and younger and younger universe. So the closer we get to the edge of our observable bubble in terms of our observations, the farther back in time we look because it's taken all that time to get to us. So what is surprising us is not that there are galaxies on the edge of our observable bubble, Of course, there are galaxies there because galaxies fill the universe. The surprise is that we're finding galaxies when the universe was so young. When our universe was only a few hundred million years old, already there are massive, fully formed, well-developed galaxies. So this is telling us that galaxies form relatively quicker, quickly, probably quicker than we were expecting them to. So that is the surprise 
I hope that clears it up. Let's go to someone else. Hello, Dr. Sutter. Tom Bach here. Uh, my question today is about some of the inherent features of space-time and the most basic of facts that as we look out into space, we're obviously also looking back in time since the light takes time to reach us. Uh, but I also think about the 3D spatial implications of this, since not only are we seeing the object as it was in the past, mm -hmm. uh, it is also physically in a different place, spatially, right? Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So an object that's 5 billion light years away has also had 5 billion years to move in some direction from our point of view. And that object is now physically in a different spot in space than we may actually mm -hmm. be observing mm -hmm. it. So my question is, as we look at the overall size of the universe, I believe currently measured at 93 billion light years across, isn't it actually okay. in our current now time far, far bigger? Meaning if we observe it at 93 billion light years across today, but that's 13.7 billion year old light that's just now reaching us. Right. So in reality, hasn't there been 13.7 unobserved years of movement to expand it much larger than we actually see it? Yes. Uh, and Tom, sorry, love you. Your question is getting a little long, so I had to stop you there. But I, I totally get your question. Um, yes. Our, uh, what I was just speaking about uh, to, to Steve Lucy was that our universe um, is much, much larger than our observable bubble. And the further back we look in time, or the further we look in space, the further we look in time. Our observable bubble, that patch is about 90 billion light years across. That includes the effects of the expansion of the universe. That already takes that into an account. What we actually see, but actually is a weird word here because cosmologically you need to define what your distances are and what you're measuring. When we see a distant galaxy and it appears to us to be, say, 10 or 11 or 12 billion light years away, it's actually right now like 40 billion light years away because the expansion of the, so that galaxy sent off some light, that light has traveled across the universe and it's taken like 10 billion years to reach us and it reaches us and we say, wow, that's a cool galaxy. In that meantime, in the meantime, that galaxy has scooted away and now it's like way over here and we can calculate how far away it actually is using our cosmological models, using cool math. So the furthest galaxy from us appears to be only like 13 billion year, light years away because our universe is about 13 billion years old. It's actually by now in the present epoch, 40 billion light years away for a diameter of 90 billion light years. So I hope that makes sense. Lots of cosmology questions today. I love it. Let's see what the space cadets are up to. We've got lots of questions here, as usual, which I always love. Let me see. Where is the start of today's questions? Uh, yeah, William Black, let's get back to the SpaceX and astronomy. Does it have to be a fight? Perhaps astronomy can benefit from lower cost access to space, inexpensive launch of orbital observatories, for example. For sure. Okay, that's a fair point. Like maybe the argument is, look, we're making access to space cheaper. One of the benefits is we're going to have like totally cool internet all across the world. Uh, another benefit is you get like 50 Hubbles tomorrow. Okay. For the our major observatories, like the Hubble, like the James Webb, like the Nancy Grace Roman that's coming up after the James Webb. The launch cost is 10, 20% of the budget. Most of the budget is in the design of a telescope that can work in space. Not the easiest thing to build. A big fraction of the budget is into the brain power in the minds who are going to uh, analyze the data and select targets and do science. They, and it's going to go into the hardware of the telescope itself. And then 10 or 20% are going to go into launch costs. So even if you drop that to zero, you don't get 50 Hubbles instead of one. You get like 1.2 Hubbles instead of one. And so I don't think that 
it's going to make it so much cheaper that we're going to have so much astronomy. In fact, a lot of astronomy, this is between you and me, a lot of astronomy is in a very similar position to where uh, particle physics is now. There is more data generated than humans can possibly analyze and study. Like we, you can write an entire thesis, a PhD thesis on archived Hubble data from 20 years ago. You can, you, it's all there. There's more data there than we can possibly analyze in a lifetime and in a dozen lifetimes. We design new telescopes because we're targeting very specific questions. But every time there's one of these giant surveys, there's just there's just mountains of data that you can comb through forever and answer interesting, cool questions about the universe. So we're not limited by the number of telescopes. We're limited by by the amount of money and the amount of money paying for researchers, scientists, grad students, the whole deal. Now, but that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, Russell is asking, will the LL, LSST or the Vera Rubin Observatory make my telescope irrelevant? I hate to break it to you. Okay. I want to answer this delicately, <laughs> which, uh, delicately for me is something like a bull in a China shop. There's this very curious relationship between professional astronomers and amateur astronomers. And I stand outside of this because I'm an astrophysicist. I'm a theorist. I do not have like, you know, I'll talk to anyone. Doesn't matter. Astronomy is one of the few sciences that has had a long tradition of amateur involvement and successful amateur involvement. Like, you look at like some of the major discoveries in astronomy over the past few hundred years. And it's usually just some like rich punk who's bored to tear some European aristocrat. Who's like, I guess I'll, I'll build a telescope in my backyard. And they, they do it. And they're like, Oh look, a new planet. Oh, that was jolly good. Like that's, it just happens. Amateur astronomers still contribute to astronomy. Like the there was the interstellar object, uh, Borisov, that was discovered by an amateur astronomer. An amateur astronomer caught, uh, what was it? It wasn't a kilonova. I think it was a failed supernova or like the initial breakout of a supernova. There was some event, some transient event that, and that an amateur astronomer was the first one to catch. Uh, amateur astronomers do a lot of asteroid tracking and monitoring, comet observing, comet finding that professional astronomers don't. So like there is a niche in the astronomy world that you could go out and buy, buy a telescope and like do something useful and, and contribute to science. So you, but by and large, 99% of astronomy is done by professional astronomers and they're not using backyard telescopes. They're using giant observatories. They're using orbiting satellites. They are using networks of telescopes. They are using you know, mind boggling, boggling huge resources uh, to do their work. And so I've always sensed this like tension of like the amateur astronomers say, hey, we contribute to astronomy, right? And the professional astronomers like patting them on the head and say, that's nice. You're nice. But they actually do genuinely contribute. So is your telescope irrelevant? No. There's, you're going to be able to do things with a backyard telescope that the LSST or the Vera Rubin Observatory is not designed to do and won't be able to capture. It's not going to see everything. I mean, it's going to see the whole night sky every night and take pictures of it constantly, but it's still going to miss things because there still has to be humans to process the data. And without the humans, if they, if they miss something or one of the algorithms that one of the astronomers develops misses something, uh, then that's an opportunity for an amateur to catch it. <laughs> Kento said, how dare you call us amateur, you cheese eater? You know what? I, I guess I'm an amateur astronomer. Like I have a telescope, uh, I play around with it every once in a while. Uh, I've used, I've analyzed data from from observatories, and I, I don't know, but I call myself an astrophysicist. It's it's a long story. It's a long story. Uh, oh yeah, see, Luke is happening. What asking? What happens as the satellites break down and fall to the earth? Like, what if a thousand of them malfunction? I think most satellites are small enough that they're going to burn up in the atmosphere. I don't know. I need to eat some cheese as I answer some more questions. 
Uh, Russell is asking... Oh, mathematics. Uh, Corvair Wind on YouTube is saying, what about ma ma mathematics that also has amateur contributions? Absolutely. There are a few feels like very few amateurs are contributing to high energy particle physics. You know, very few amateurs are contributing to genomics or neurology. But, um, you know, amateurs are contributing to mathematics. They're contributing to geology and biology. They're contributing to mathematics. Uh, and they're contributing to uh, the study of cheese, which if there was a PhD in it, I'm, I might have switched. Today's cheese brought to us by our very good friends at Dom's Cheese. That's D-O-M-S cheese.com. Nancy, thank you for putting it in the chat. And thank you, Russell, for the super chat tonight. And uh, also putting in the show notes. Today's cheese. Ooh, I'm looking forward to this. This is a... a Tete de Mon, Tete de Mon, head of the monk. Look, in the, the foil wrapper has a little picture of some monks doing some fun things with cheese. They're, they're very happy with their cheese. This is, this is Swiss. It's from uh, the Jura Mountains. This, this cheese has been made for over eight centuries. That is wonderful. The monks of Bellelay Abbey, they devised a special... Ooh, wow. Uh, they had to devise a special device for making like little flowers or like little heads of cheese. And they thought it was funny, I guess. Described as raw cow's milk, semi-hard cheese, dense texture, a seriously intense fruity flavor. Stronger and sweeter among the Swiss cheese varieties. There's, you can get a nice look at that. Look at that rind. Wow. I It is strong. It is oddly fruity it, it almost smells like rotten fruit you know like a like if you like like a grape that's halfway to being a raisin you're not sure if you're gonna get raisin or if you're gonna get botulism it is interesting and is it's it's kind of fun actually i like it mm-hmm now wow That is something else. That is something else. Uh, the flavor is nothing like the smell. It is smooth. It is velvety. It is creamy. I mean, it's it's a hard cheese, but it's like so smooth once you bite into it. And as you're biting it, you're smelling it. It smells a little bit funky and like, oh my gosh, what stepped on this before they wrapped it up? But then you start eating it. It just opens up mellows out you know i have a complicated relationship with swiss cheeses because some of them are just too i don't know like tangy but this is good this is good tete de one out of the monk from switzerland thank you to dom's cheese d-o-m-s cheese.com for supplying it Visto Tutti is asking, where can we get your Sutter's Law t-shirt? So I'm wearing a t-shirt that says, if it's interesting, it's probably wrong. I also have a mug. It's it's over there. It's not in front of the camera right now. You can get it on my website. Yes, yes, Fifth Dimension. It's made with old monk sandals. That's exactly what it smells like. Sandal of the monk. Wow, but then you eat it and it turns out, turns out monk sandals taste amazing. They got some funky bacteria that we love. <laughs> Um, you can get these t-shirts and mugs over on my website, pmsutter.com slash store. You can order t-shirts and mugs with Sutter's Law on it. You can also get copies of my book, How to Die in Space and Your Place in the Universe. Autograph copies. If you don't want the autograph copy, just buy from Barnes and Noble or Amazon or whatever. And, um, yeah, what a show. What a show. I wonder what I'll rant about next week. Catch the live stream every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, Nancy Graziano, for wrangling the Space Cadets and producing this show. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter. This show is brought to you by you. Please go to patreon.com slash pmsutter to keep this show going. And of course, thank you again, Space Cadets, for listening. See you next week. And remember, science is for sharing. End of transmission.